Hello, and thank you for joining us this Sunday morning at Evangelist Crusaders Morning Worship Service. We're so happy that you decided to stop a while and worship the Lord right along with us. We want to let you know that we still are on location at 4307 4th Avenue South here in Minneapolis. And we invite you to come on out and you can feel safe as you worship the Lord right along with us. If you prefer to still watch this on the three venues that we have available, you are more than welcome to join us. Pull us up on our website at www.evangelistcrusaders.com. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube at Evangelist Crusaders Church. Now we are so thankful for those of you who have been supporting us with your prayers and your financial giving all these many months. And we want to continue to ask you to do that if you certainly desire to do so. We invite you to go to our website and click on the Givelify link or you can just download the app to your phone. You'll find us under Evangelist Crusaders. Our address there is 4307 4th Avenue South. We've also been encouraged by the cards and letters that you have sent. It is a blessing to know that we are being a blessing to you. So if you prefer the written word, address all of your correspondence to Evangelist Crusaders Church, Post Office Box 7291, Minneapolis, Minnesota. The zip code is 55407. And now we're going to go directly into the word of God. I know that you're going to be blessed. Listen and enjoy. So praise the Lord. Last week, as I had thought to talk on that subject in regard to liberty, I also um, knew that it was a 4th of July holiday, but I thought better. You know, it would be better that we would talk a little bit about what Reverend Wright had mentioned in her message the week before, when she referred to Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And if you remember from last week, what did we talk about? And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You know, I really like the way that Jesus emphasized how people in his day were seeking the kingdom of God. By his choice of those figurative words, <coughs> pardon me, of um, violence and violent. And I wanted to emphasize that we should be like those people today. And using these words, Jesus was trying to show us how passionate the, these people were seeking the kingdom of God. You know, maybe another word that we could use would be aggressively seeking him in their approach. So I think being violent, passionate, aggressive, and determined, as opposed to being weak, emotionless, passive, and What's this word? Lackadaisical. How do you like that word? Uh, are important characteristics if we're going to grow and succeed in the Lord. For instance, take a look at this reference in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13. It says, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Now what picture do you get in your mind when you listen to that phrase, Search for me with all your heart. I picture someone who is passionate about seeking God. Now, people who are passionate about stuff, you can tell who they are. Be there, what that, and you can tell what they're passionate about. Be it uh, people or things or places, you, you see it all evidenced in their passion. Um, when they are passionate about something, they really aggressively seek after it to the nth degree. Well, you'll see this commonly in what, real man? Romantic endeavors, the world of sports and business, education, scientific and medical research, political or social activism. These are just a few ways in which people are passionate and go to the nth degree to apply themselves to obtain what they want. I think passion is also something we will need in spiritual warfare, whether it's regarding warfare's offensive or defensive applications. Now, we can easily consider that there's passion in the offensive side of spiritual warfare. As we picture going after the enemy while we're out there trying to enlarge and expand the kingdom of God. Would you agree? Oh, you don't agree with that? Well, let, me, let me say it again. 
Now we can easily consider that there is passion in the offensive side of spiritual warfare as we endeavor to go out and win souls for the Lord. I'll put it that way. Would you agree with that one? Well, I hope there is. Uh, in using our spiritual armor noted in Ephesians chapter 6 to illustrate this, the passionate offensive side of our warfare can be seen by what two articles there at least? Uh, the sword of the spirit and our feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Think of those being part of the offense, which we're going to do with a cut, and what we're going to do to run to get there. But the protective aspects of our spiritual armor show us that there is a defensive need for our armor as well. Loins girt about with truth, breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, our helmet of salvation, and even most definitely that sword of the Spirit, and our feet being prepared to preach the gospel of Christ are important for our protection. In our defense. So today I'm going to talk about the need to be passionate in our defense posture in spiritual warfare. And I'm going to use the book of Galatians to illustrate this. Now in Galatians chapter 5, this will be my text verse for today. It says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of a bondage. And if we're going to live free, we're going to need to believe in our freedom. We're going to have to think free, being armed with the Word of God. And we're going to have to take firm action to defend our freedom against the forces of the enemy. We cannot be passive in spiritual warfare and think that we are going to walk in freedom. I want to give you what I'll call the five ups for gaining success against spiritual attack. Wake up, stand up, speak up, build yourselves up, and look up. The first up is wake up. And I said that a little loud just in case you were sleeping so you would all wake up. <laughs> so you can hear the rest of this message. So in writing the epistle to the Galatians, Paul is trying to help them understand that they have been duped by the enemy. Whereas they may have considered themselves doing the right thing by returning to certain aspects of the law of Moses, and in particular, the practice of circumcision, they were actually totally headed down the wrong path. Even to the point of canceling out the purifying effect of the cross in their lives. If they held to the teachings that were being delivered to them by the false teachers, they would return to a doctrine of works for righteousness and salvation, and they would actually fall from grace. So the first thing the Galatians needed to do to have an effective defense against the enemy was to be awakened to the fact that they were under an assault. To realize that they had been lulled to sleep by a deceitful doctrine of the enemy. And their guard was now totally down. And they were allowing the enemy to rob them of their liberty. They had to wake up. The second and third up go hand in hand. So I'll present them together. They are stand up and speak up. To demonstrate and prove his argument that the works of the law of for righteousness stand in opposition to the righteousness of faith, Paul presented his own faith journey to the Galatian church, noting especially how he was at one time very zealous for the law of Moses. He then showed them how through divine revelation he had received the doctrines that he preached, and therefore the instructions that they had received from him were actually truth. He validated this by the fact that when he had finally gone up to Jerusalem after many years, it was 14 plus, after his conversion, and for the first time he encountered many of the apostles, a number of them, he presented to the apostles and to the other elders what he had been teaching to the Gentiles, and they had nothing to say against it. Moreover, they didn't even add anything to it. And beyond that, they committed the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles to Paul, to oversee as the top authority figure, Asking that he only would remember the poor, which he had already been occasioned to do. But during this time when Paul was presenting his doctrine to these leaders as a safety check, he just wanted to make sure that he hadn't ran in vain. 
Now, there were false brethren that had crept in unawares, trying to introduce their false doctrine concerning circumcision. But Paul immediately stood up against them and didn't give them a moment to spread their mess. So what will help us to stand fast is to swiftly stand up against the enemy as he's trying to, to present anything to us, and we're not going to give him the time of day. Be quick to raise your shield of defense to his attacks and be adamant about repelling them. Now, in standing up, you may also have to be speaking up. And you may just have to verbalize your defense. A lot of us do it all the time. Now, we see a clear example of this when Paul relays an incident concerning the Apostle Peter. While Peter was there in the city with Paul, which was called Antioch. Peter had come up from Jerusalem, and he was quite comfortable in that city, now eating with the Gentiles, even though he was a Jew. And Paul refers to Peter later on as living like a Gentile. But when certain of the brethren came up from Jerusalem at the order of James to Antioch, Peter was so afraid of what they would say and what they might do, that he got up from the dinner table of the Gentiles, and he separated himself. And it was so influential that other Jews followed his example, even to the fact that the Apostle Paul's right-hand man, his faithful companion Barnabas, joined in their folly. Paul immediately spoke up, and he rebuked the Apostle Peter before them all. So sometimes to stand fast, you are going to have to speak up and cry out, against the air of something or Satan's attack by using your mouth to voice the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that's based upon the Word of God. Now in these two examples that I've given, each of which Paul spoke up, stood up rather, spoke up to counter the enemy's mischief, I see where Paul actually modeled what we often refer to in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. When we talk about spiritual warfare, here's what it says, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm going to substitute a few words there and read that fifth verse again. Casting down imaginations or casting down false reasonings. And every assertion that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we got a lot of that going on in our society today, don't we? In Galatians, Paul models how to cast down false reasoning and assertions. And the need to swiftly stand up and speak up to counter false doctrine and hypocrisy with the truth of God's word. This he did to counter the erring effects, such things that would have that effect on the minds of those that were listening and seeing these things that were going on. And thus it helps us to know that in order to stand fast in our liberty, wherein we are called, we're also going to have to wake up, stand up, and speak up. So now for the last two ups, and aren't you glad? I'm just about done. <laughs> oh, you're not falling asleep on me today. So far, we've learned that in, in liberty, we need to wake up, stand up, and speak up. Now for the last two, the four and five, I'm going to conclude uh, going to the book of Jude. Now, many of us are familiar with at least one verse from Jude's epistle. It says here in verse 3, there's only one chapter in Jude, so I didn't give you a chapter. There's only one chapter. Verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation... It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now there could be a couple of ways to interpret this verse. As contend can mean to strive or to pursue for something, after something. Or it can mean to stand up for. So I lean towards the former even though both have merit. And Jude notes how there were false teachers who had entered into the flock, and they were corrupting the gospel. He then gives examples of the judgment that's going to come on those who deviated from the faith and his truth. Afterwards, he proceeds with a very figurative and harsh description of those who have erred 
from the truth and who bring bad influence onto the saints. And as he closes his epistle, he points to two things that I think are also important in our quest to stand fast. Jude said in verse 20 and 21, But ye, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So the fourth key is to build ourselves up. In Jews' exhortation, this is done by praying in the Holy Ghost. Now this is one passage I think kind of validates that tongues are very important to the Christian believer. And by keeping ourselves in the practice of walking in and exhibiting the love of God. Those two things build us up. Because when we practice what we preach, we get stronger in doing it, don't we? When you feel and do the things of God through the love of God that he's given you, you feel better. You get nourished. You get strength. Then in Joshua chapter 1, God instructs Joshua to do it by meditating in the word, doesn't he? He says, don't let this word depart from your eyes. So we can build ourselves up by prayer, by practicing the love of God and absorbing the word of God into our spirit. And as we do this, Jude says we are to be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I will shorten that up to we are to look up. That's the fifth up. So we got wake up, stand up, speak up, build ourselves up and look up. To look up means we have to keep our eyes on the prize. When we lose sight of the reward that is for all of our spiritual conflict, if we go through it successfully, and, 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 and we lose sight of it or we set it on the back burner, our anticipation of the eternal prize our desire to, and our desire to please the Lord, we leave ourselves very vulnerable to succumb to things like discouragement and temptation and compromise because we've lost focus. We lose sense, a sense of grip because we've lost sense of purpose. So at times like this, then that multi-applicable scripture that all of us probably can quote in our sleep, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, really comes in handy. What does he say? He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. This along with remembering the Lord is coming back is going to help us continue to look up. One day the Lord is going to descend with a shout. The Bible says it with the trump of God. Those that are saved are going to be raptured to ever be with the Lord. Free from all of the toil, all of the struggle, and all the spiritual conflicts that really assault us in this present day. We will finally live that eternal bliss that God had desired for us. So it is worth standing fast for. Because that payday is coming. It may come sooner rather than later. Or it may come later rather than sooner. But payday is coming. Look at your neighbor and say, payday is, payday is coming. My reward is coming. I'm going to keep on looking up because I know that one day that's where I'll be. Hallelujah. Amen. It's going to all be worthwhile. <laughs> Amen. So in summary, we need to be violent, passionate, aggressive, and determined. To stand fast in the liberty wherein Christ has made us free. By doing so, we can avoid being entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Yes. No matter what that yoke or what that bondage might look like for any one of us. There's a number of things that people get bound by. They get caught up in. And they start out very simply and all of a sudden they don't have it. It has them. That's just how the devil plans it. He gives you just enough to tantalize your interest. And then, you know, it's just like that. Well, Lord, forgive us. We put that little worm on the end of that hook. 
We put it down on the water and we wiggle it just enough so that little fishy, oh, what is that? Lunch, mommy, lunch, lunch. Don't go there, Junior. No, mommy, it's lunch, lunch. No, Junior, no, Junior. Mommy, I'm going whoa, whoa, whoa. And Junior goes floating up through the sky of the lake, never to be seen again. But that's what the devil does to us. He gives us a little bait just enough to hook us. And then when he finally gets his claws in us, he's like a pit bull and won't let us go. But if we're violent and passionate and aggressive and determined to stand in the liberty that's in Christ Jesus, we can avoid being caught up in that kind of air. So no matter what the yoke or the bondage might be, let's continue to wake up, stand up, speak up, build ourselves up. And look up so we can have the victory. Amen. Amen. That's the message today. God bless you. I enjoyed that. Thank you, God. Praise God. You know, and if there's anyone in the house, that doesn't know the Lord as their personal Lord and Savior, even on the way. These truths that Pastor spoke of today is just a reminder for the children of God that we are not defeated. God has given us ammunition and weapons for this warfare. But you can only access them through Jesus Christ. So if there's anyone in the audience that doesn't know the Lord, is your own personal Lord and Savior. This is an invitation. Not to join the church. To join heaven, praise God. To get what Jesus came to die that you might have. Abundant life, praise God. So if there's anyone that would like to accept the altar call, you can stand right where you're at. Anyone on the web, just say, Jesus, I want to try you today. Yes. I want to know more about you. This Even as the word came today, it's to draw you to the cross of Christ. So, Father, I pray today that your word fall not on deaf ears, God, but that it would fall on the fertile ground of someone's soul today, God, in the name of Jesus. And I pray that, God, with that, understanding would come because you said to him that understands more will be given. And God, this word would bring forth fruit in their lives like you promised God. God, you said that they would confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart, God, that you raised them from the dead on the third day, that they would be saved. It's that simple. So God, I pray today that someone would take this invitation to heart, literally, and to accept your son so they can have the right to the tree of life. I pray this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God.